Our theme this week, in times like these, in times like these, we need the Bible, the basics, we need to be bold. Those were the sermons from Sunday. Monday night, in times like these, we need to be balanced. And Brother Ty Rimes brought us an excellent message concerning biblical balance. Last night, extraordinary message preached by Brother Cliff Goodwin. In times like these, we need our brethren. And tonight, uh, Brother Steve Higginbotham is here from the Carnes Congregation in Knoxville. And he will speak to us in a little while. In times like these, we need to believe. We don't give up ever. God is still on the throne. We're still trusting in Him. And I know this is going to be a, a, a great uh, a finale to a great lectureship. And I appreciate the presence of all of you. Some of you are visiting with us tonight, and you've been on other nights of the uh, lectureship, and we're glad to, to have you again with us. Always welcome. I want to make a few announcements here at the outset this evening that relate to the Riverbend Church. Uh, if our visitors would give me just about a minute or so to do this, uh, typically on Wednesday night we do have some announcements that need to be made. And we have got a rather lengthy sick list right now. Uh, we want to continue to remember Brother Gary Earnhardt, one of our elders who is uh, recovering still at home from a recent knee replacement surgery. Uh, also, uh, Sister Linda Mazel was in the hospital. She's now home, and uh, I talked to her last night. She's doing better, but now George is sick. So please remember them. Uh, Wes Sumner has the flu, so remember Wes in your prayers. Uh, I spoke with Brother David Ellis this afternoon, and he said he's a little better, but he feels as if Sister Joyce is about to suffer a relapse. She's not been having a good day. And then uh, please remember Regina Cook. Regina Cook has been visiting with us. She recently moved to the Dalton area. Uh, she was invited to visit River Bend uh, through Linda Mazel. And uh, she is enjoying the time that she has been visiting with us. And we're looking forward to getting to know her better, to study with her, to encourage her. But I talked to her today also after having been informed last night by Sister Linda that Regina's mother is uh, in Atlanta Hospital in critical condition, uh, taking off life support. Regina told me this afternoon her mother's hanging on, but, uh, but uh, the news um, as far as recovery for uh, her is not good. It's a, a, a very, very grim right now for Regina's mother. So this provides us a wonderful opportunity to reach out to someone who's new to the area, who enjoys coming to Riverbend and has already met some of you. Uh, I told her that we are remembering her and her mother and her entire family in prayer and do all that we can to, we'll do all that we can to encourage her, especially during this difficult time. So please remember these uh, in your prayers. We are glad to see Sister Gail uh, back tonight. She's had a rough few days, but I'm glad she's feeling better and she's here this evening. Uh, also, uh, married couples at River Bend, please remember to sign uh, the list in the lobby if you plan to attend the February 10th Valentine's Banquet. Uh, that'll be at 5 o'clock Saturday, February 10th. And Sister Claire, who is coordinating this effort, uh, would really like for you to sign that tonight. Uh, because she needs to start planning uh, how much food she needs to get for this event. So if uh, you have not already signed the list, please do so tonight. And this coming Sunday, of course, we'll meet uh, 9.30, 10.30, and 5, as we typically do. Uh, but at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon in the Old Fellowship Hall, uh, the elders look forward to meeting with uh, uh, any members who would like to come to a meeting of the uh, renovation project uh, committee. Uh, we're interested in your ideas, what you'd like to see done here uh, over the next few months as we look forward to the remodeling of our auditorium and lobby area. And so uh, uh, this committee that's being formed will aid your elders uh, receiving um, uh, uh, some of the um, 
ideas that you have and, and also, of course, if you can assist in some way as we go through this renovation project, uh, we'd appreciate that also. So anyway, that's Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. If you'd like to be part of that, we would welcome you. We're glad tonight that uh, Sister Kim Higginbotham is here with Brother Steve. Celicia and I enjoyed a wonderful dinner with them tonight for a long, long time. Uh, while I was preaching at a congregation with a school of preaching in West Tennessee, Brother Steve was over uh, in East Tennessee preaching for a congregation with a school of preaching, and he still is. Uh, but we would only see each other maybe in passing occasionally at a lecture program or something like that. I've long admired his work and uh, familiar with his fine preaching, but tonight was special to my wife and me because we got to know the Higginbotham's better and we're so glad we could have dinner with them. And now I'm so thankful we have the opportunity to study uh, under his uh, tutelage tonight. And uh, we're thankful that they uh, can, can be here uh, with us. And uh, they have uh, children in the Chattanooga area. And one son uh, particularly, uh, Matthew, is uh, a preacher in the Chattanooga area. And I've had the privilege of meeting Matthew and getting to know him. So this is a great family. And I know that Brother Steve, uh, uh, his father, Brother Frank Higginbotham, a, a fine preacher uh, from West Virginia, uh, he's been uh, uh, gone from us uh, for quite a number of years, passed on to his reward, uh, but Steve comes from a really fine family and he has a great family and we're looking forward to the message tonight. Uh, I've got all three of my children here tonight sitting right there on the same row with their uh, mother, and uh, I'm happy that Kaysen and Chelsea could be with us tonight, and Kaysen's going to lead us in singing, and, uh, and then Brother Steve McCaslin and Sister Bonnie are here tonight from Adairsville, and Brother McCaslin is a longtime preacher, missionary, and elder. He's going to lead us in prayer after two songs, and uh, then at the appropriate time, uh, Brother Steve will come and deliver the message. In times like these, we need to believe. Uh, let's stand together for the first song. Two hundred forty three. Two hundred forty three. <clears throat> it was a prize
In thy field I would wield sickles brave and true in the fight for the right I would dare and do spend my days in thy praise all the journey through let me live close to thee each day let me live close to thee God and our Father in heaven, we come to you tonight thanking you for another beautiful day that you've given us, all of which reminds us of your power and your presence in our lives to see the beauty of this earth. We stand in awe of your greatness your creative power. We know as your word teaches us that you merely spoke and it was done. We can only imagine this kind of power. But we're thankful, Father, that you are our God and that we can call upon you as our, as our Father in heaven. Tonight, Father, we're mindful of this congregation and those that Barry mentioned who are sick. We pray for each and every one of them, the members of this congregation, who are struggling in any way. And in a special way, we ask your blessings on Regina Cook especially as she um, considers the condition of her mother and as a visitor has maybe opportunity, we pray, to learn of you and to uh, become one of your children here. We're thankful, Father, for this congregation and her many good works. We just pray that you would continue to be with them and bless them in all of their efforts to reach the lost of this community and indeed throughout the world. We're thankful, Father, for this series of meetings with the theme, In Times Like These, 
we recognize, Father, that these are very difficult times, not only for America, but also the world. We realize that Satan is real, that he has tremendous influence and power in the lives of people who do not know you. We live in a time of so much hate and division. People who don't even know their gender, who think of life as being cheap, who Many in high places are even uh, calling for the annihilation of a whole nation of people. It's hard to imagine that we live in times like these, which makes this theme so special, so especially appropriate. We pray your blessings on Brother Higginbotham tonight. We're thankful for he and his wife, their good family, for the many good years of influence they've had <clears throat> on many, many people, many that they don't even know because of Steve's preaching as well as his writing. <clears throat> Certainly in times like this, we need to believe we do believe in you, and we're so thankful for your love for us, for the gospel that you've made available to us, and for the privilege of knowing it. Please be with us tonight as we continue with this worship. We trust that everything that we do and say will be in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the invitation song will be number 714. 714. And before the lesson, let's stand and sing number five. Number five. <clears throat>
It's good to be here tonight. I appreciate so much the invitation to be with you. I think Austin Fowler uh, invited me a few years ago, and uh, I've been, well, maybe, I don't remember when it was. Maybe it wasn't quite that long ago. But anyway, I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad to be able to bring my wife for uh, almost 40 years, uh, we've had kids, you know, in, and uh, finally our youngest daughter went off to college and she's able to uh, go with me some places and, and so that, that is enjoyable for me at any rate. But I, let me tell you something. Um, whenever I go somewhere for the very first time, I do this everywhere I go. And since I have never been in Dalton, Georgia before, um, I'm going to go ahead and answer a question for you. Two questions, actually. Um, I just go ahead and answer your questions, and that way I'll get it out of the way, and you won't have to be thinking about it while I'm preaching, and you can pay attention, okay? So here are your answers. I'm 6'6", six, six, and yes, I play basketball. Can, <laughs> can we be done with that? I mean, that every time. Nobody has asked me that yet. I did have somebody call me Shorty. But, but nobody, when I go places, usually they have like, can you change the clock back an hour? I change clocks, I change light bulbs, all those kind of things when I go somewhere. But um, yeah, I, I have dealt with people, you know, tall, th I've been tall all my life. And I've had people come up to me and, and, you know, they'll get right next to you and poke you in the ribs and say, how's the weather up there? And they'll just slap their legs like that. Like I've never heard that one before, you know. <laughs> And uh, so years ago, I decided I'm going to work on a comeback because I hear this all the time. And uh, I was actually in West Virginia when this happened. I was preaching in uh, St. Albans, West Virginia. And a man, I, I had finished talking. And before I got down out of the pulpit, it was a lectureship. He came up in the pulpit and got right up in my chest and looked up at me and said, how tall are you anyway? Just hateful sound. And I said, I I'm 6'6". Six, six. And he said, I bet you played basketball. And I said, yes. And uh, with that, he turned and started to walk away. And I said, well, wait a second. How tall are you? And he said, I I'm 5'4". And I said, I bet you played miniature golf, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? He didn't do what you just did. Um, he got pretty red faced. So I'm just warning you, I'm ready for you. If you want to go there, I've seen a few miniature golf people come in tonight. But um, I did. One time I was going to the back of the building and a lady uh, met me after I'd preached and she came out and she said, young man, how tall are you? And I said, I'm five foot, 18 inches. And uh, she said, I could have sworn you were over six feet. <laughs> but. <laughs> Anyway, I've had a lot of fun with my height. You don't bother me with your comments, but uh, I, I usually use that as an icebreaker. But again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to talk about faith with you tonight. I hope you have your Bible, and uh, we'll be looking at a couple passages as we uh, call them out. And um, I hope that you'll be encouraged um, and strengthened as you leave here today. I, I don't know, I have stood at the, the head of a lot of caskets in 40 years of preaching. And I don't know how people go through the hardest times in life when they don't have faith in God. I mean, that's the end for people and the hope of the Christian, as Paul talks about. Uh, we, it extends beyond the grave. We're, we're not left with that, but it's, it's our faith that enables us to have the strength to get through these moments in life uh, in a way that is not only honoring to God, but helps us uh, to navigate the circumstances of life. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 8, Jesus has just told a, a given a parable about a persistent widow who um, just kept going back to the judge and back to the judge. She's wanting vindication for her cause, and she would not relent. And finally, the judge, uh, just because she was wearing him out, he finally relented and gave her what she was desiring. And then Jesus makes what I think is kind of a stunning statement in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. 
He said, when the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on earth? Now that Bible, that, that verse is translated in different ways. Some translations say, will he find faith on earth? Other translations will say, will he, fi will he really find faith on earth? And yet other translations will say, will he find this kind of faith? On earth, And I think that that's what he's talking about. Not that there will not be people that will have faith, but do you have the kind of faith of this woman who persistently brought her cause before the judge? She believed that he could do something for her and would not relent. And, and so Jesus is asking, when, when I come again, will people have that kind of faith? on this earth? It's a good question. You know, cultures, they, they change, they shift. Cultures experience ebbs and flows in their morality. There are, uh, or, or if you wanna say peaks and, and valleys. Um, we see that in the book of Judges. And in a period of time, you know, in the book of Judges, there are seven of these cycles where the people become so sinful that God sends an oppressor. And then because of the oppression and their circumstances, they lift their eyes to God and they ask for forgiveness and they repent. And so God sends a deliverer, a judge. And, and they're brought out of their circumstances and brought back into a right relationship with God. And it doesn't take very long until they just fall right back into the depths of sin and God will bring another oppressor. And, but so you have this movement through the, the book of Judges seven times of this oppression and or sin and then oppression and then repentance and deliverance. So in that culture, Right there in that book, you see good times and you see bad times, culturally speaking. Nations go through that same thing still today. Our nation is going through that. Do you think we're on a mountaintop of morality in our culture today? If you do, I'd say you're probably the only one that does. We, have, we are on the moral downgrade uh, we, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we're not even sure to, we're, we're not even able to describe or to tell what a woman is, to give a definition of what a woman is. We have people saying that men can have babies today. It just go, it, it boggles your mind. And all we have to do, go back 50 years. Is that what we, is that where our culture was 50 years ago? Go back 150 years or 200 years and we're back into the times where the restoration movement was taking root and there were people that were flocking to that. We love the idea of going back to the Bible, giving up our creeds, shedding all this denominational baggage and just being Christians. That message doesn't resonate with our culture like it once did. Now it does with some. And, and I'm not despairing like, oh, no, what's going to happen to the church? The Bible tells us, the Hebrew writer says, that it is unshakable and it's unmovable. The church is going to be fine. It may not be fine in our culture for a while, but it will not be destroyed. Uh, we have that promise from the book of Daniel. But in our culture, I think we're on the downgrade. If there was ever a time when we are lacking faith in our culture, it is now. I think probably worse now than it ever has been since uh, this country began. Um, a survey was done by Pew Research, and uh, it goes all the way back to the 1970s. In the 1970s, 90% of our culture said they have faith or they believe in God. 90%. In uh, 19, or 2021, that figure was 63%. A little over half of the people have faith in God now. And the startling thing is that statistic of 90% from 1970, if you went to the year 2000, it was still 90%. It's just in the last 20 years, 
Faith in God has significantly taken a nosedive. People do not believe anymore. I never used to do this, but as I've gotten older, do, you, do y'all read obituaries? Um, I started doing that. Um, I, I have, uh, uh, you know, on, on my uh, Facebook account, I, I, where I grew up, there was an Arner's funeral home, and I subscribed to that, so if somebody back home dies, I, I uh, see that. And then... Um, you know, back where I used to preach in Glasgow, Kentucky, I, I do the same thing to the funeral home there. And so I'm always going through and saying, reading the obituary, no mention of church, no mention of their faith. Over and over, uh, you know, far surpassing the person who had any kind of faith at all is the fact that faith is not ever once mentioned. How do you live your life without faith? And why are there so many people? We comment all the time. We live in this little subdivision that's close to the church building. When we get up and go to church on Sunday morning, there are cars everywhere. No one's going to church. Everybody. And we have a lot of kids in our subdivision. And they're being brought up without faith in God. And, and uh, there are just other things that have crowded it out. And it brings to mind that question. When I come again, will there be faith on the earth? Well, good question. And so I want us to talk about three reasons tonight why we need to believe or to have faith. And the first reason is this. We need to have faith in God in order to be pleasing to him. You know the passage, right? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith or belief, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, you have to believe in his existence, that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, faith is more than, and you've probably heard this many times, it's more than just mental assent. Oh yeah, I believe in God, but you, it doesn't impact your life. It doesn't have anything to do with the way you live. You just believe in a supreme being, but it doesn't affect your commitment or your lifestyle or anything. That's not what he's talking about. Faith, that saving faith that you read about in the Bible is a kind of uh, faith that means that you trust him. Do you trust God? That's really a good question that we should all sit back and give an honest evaluation. It's real easy to say, oh yeah, I believe in God. I believe in God ever since I was a kid. But do you trust him? You know, when my children were little, they may be standing on a kitchen counter and I might come stand a little bit away and I'll say, jump. They didn't hesitate to jump. They had absolute faith, trust that I would catch them. Um, do you have that kind of faith with God? Do you take him at his word or do you have to like, um, you know, hold on with one hand? Do you trust God to, to know what's best for your life? To lead you in a way that is good for you, not only in this life, but in the next life. Let me give you an example of the kind of trust I'm talking about. And, and it's summed up in the person of Abraham. You remember Abraham. He's the father of the faithful, Romans chapter 4 and verse 16. He's been dubbed that because of his faith. And, and anyone who follows in his footsteps, he becomes our father. He's the father of the faithful. Well, what was it that made Abraham so astounding? Well, God came to him and told him to get up and move. Move away from your kinfolk. Move away to a land that doesn't belong to you. To a land where you will be foreigners and uh, I'm not even telling you where yet. Just get up and go. And he went. 
How do you do that? Do you have that kind of faith? If God were to speak to you today, and of course he's not, but if God were to speak to you today, maybe you just finished building your, your dream house. Maybe you just got the job that you have always wanted all your life and you are getting settled in and you love it. Maybe your kids got into the high school and they're excelling in sports or in band or whatever and, and you just love it. And, and then God says, I want you to just get up and move. I'll tell you where later, but just, just leave where you are, leave your family behind and, and just go where I tell you to go. Would we have the trust in God to do what he said. Wait, you mean leave, lose my job? Wait, you, you're talking about uh, me getting rid of this house that I've worked so hard on? Giving up? You see, that, that's a bigger deal than we think. But the, what I believe is much harder than that, and we read about that in Hebrews chapter 11. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 19, we learn that God took Abraham and said, I want you to offer your son, your son of promise. This is the long-awaited son that would be, continue on the seed line of, of Abraham and to fulfill the Lord's promise to make him a great nation. And I want you to take that son and, and I want you to build an altar and I want you to sacrifice that son on that altar. Do you have that kind of faith? What if God told you to do something that drastic? Would you argue with them? Would you say, uh, are you sure you know what you're talking about here? Would you say, it wouldn't be right for me to do this. I'm not going to do it, God. I, it would be a violation of your own law. Would, would you argue with God or would you trust him? You know what? Abraham took him up and I wish I had a window into how that went down. Like, what, what did he tell Isaac? And how hard would that have been? And, and was Isaac willing? Or did he have to chase him down? You know, did he have to catch him and, and tie him down? I, I don't know any of the details, but I know that Abraham raised his hand. Now, again, the Hebrew writer tells us his faith in God, his belief in God was so strong that he said, I know he made me a promise that through this boy that I would be a great nation and so if I go through with this, he'll just raise him from the dead. That, that's how he was reasoning in his mind when he was asked to do what he did. And, and you know how that God stilled his hand and told him to stop. Um, now I know that you trust me, that you have faith in me. Will there be, when Jesus comes to this earth again, will there be that kind of faith? Will Abraham have spiritual descendants where we have the same kind of faith that Abraham had? I sometimes question that. Let me give you, a, and here's where it rubs. I'll just give you an example. And this is why I'm saying we need to go home and we need to think about this and make sure that we trust God so much that we would do anything that he asks. When it comes to family, You've heard the expression, blood's thicker than water. Uh, may our family ties are tight. Just this past week, uh, I'm on a little email list of preachers, and a guy wrote in a question and said, um, what, what do you do if your own child is disciplined by a church? What do you do about that? You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, you're to withdraw from that person. Pull away. It, we're not to keep company with. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 says, you know, withdraw from him. Don't keep company with him. Paul even said in 1 Corinthians 5, don't even eat socially with that person. Yeah, but that's, that's family. Wonder what would have happened if Abraham said, God, I'll make you a sacrifice, but not Isaac. That's my boy. If our children, to bring it home, if our children or our parents or our aunts and uncles or grandparents 
who are Christians but have turned their back on God and persist in a life of sin, do you have the kind of faith to follow God's command, to withdraw from them, to, to uh, not keep company with them, not even to eat with them? You see, if we want to be descendants of Abraham, we have to love God even more than our family. And you may be saying, well, you know, you're just talking. Listen, we have four children. And uh, our children were a breeze to raise. They were really good kids. Our oldest son, when he got in college, turned his back on God. And we explained to him, and we were patient with him for a long period of time, and he has persisted in a life with his back to God. He would love to have fellowship with us on his terms. We made it abundantly clear to him, and I'll tell you, there's nothing more heartbreaking in our life than that event. I, for years... Uh, would wake up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning for years, and just jolted awake with my thought, my son. We would do anything, but we won't do that. I know what the Lord teaches. And we sat our son down and we said, listen, we love you, but we love the Lord more. And we're going to follow the Lord's commands. And we'll encourage you to repent. And we'll, we'll, we'll do that, but we're not going, it's not going to be Christmas as usual. It's not going to be Thanksgiving as usual. It's going to be different. Because not only are you our son, but you're our brother in Christ. And we know what the Lord said. I don't want to be someone who, unlike Abraham, is willing to make hard decisions. It's costly, but um, we have to have faith to be pleasing to God. And I trust what God says about church discipline. I trust that he has not led me astray. And when he has given the commands that he has, I trust that he has given me wise counsel, and, and because of that trust, we're going to follow him. But will people do that? Will this kind of faith be found on earth when Jesus comes again? Faith is required. We read that in Hebrews chapter, six, or chapter 11 and verse 6. But listen to what he says. Without faith it is impossible to please him. You can't please God without trusting. And then he says, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The end of our faith is salvation. The reward of heaven. And I want that more than anything. So point number one, we need faith to be pleasing to God. Point number two, we need faith to fulfill the mission of God. Have you ever thought about that? How are we going to do? Jesus left in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we'll talk about them in just a minute. He left a great commission, and he told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are to teach people. We are to make disciples, followers of Jesus, um, you know, apprentices, someone who is looking at Jesus and trying to learn from him, and they live their life that way. That's what we've been given the mission to do. But I'm telling you, if you don't have faith, you're not going to engage in that. Our trust and faith in God is required. I heard the story about a man, a preacher one time. Well, there were, like here, there are no flowers. Have you been to churches that have this big flower arrangement right here in the front? You know, so, some preachers aren't very good looking, I guess, and so maybe that flower arrangement's good. Uh, but uh, there was this, th these ladies, they pitched together several thousand dollars and bought this huge floral arrangement to beautify the pulpit. And one day, they came in 
and the flower and the, the stand that it was on was gone. They immediately went to the elders. Where's our flowers? And they said, well, we don't know. Are they gone? Yeah, look, it's not in front of the pulpit. And so they made an announcement. If anybody knows where the flowers are, uh, could you bring them back? The women put a lot of time and money in that and effort and, and bought that, and it's really not supposed to be taken out of the building. Nobody brought it back. So they did a phone tree, you know, like the, 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 everybody in the church gets called. If you, know, if you know where the flower, if you took it for any reason, oh, we're not going to ask any questions, and you don't even have to tell us who you are. Just bring it back. Um, it never came back. They put the, the janitor and had him go through every nook and cranny in the building. And he came back and said, it's not in the building. And they thought, did anybody get married? Like maybe they hauled it off to some venue uh, because it was so pretty and nobody had gotten married. And uh, it was in a bulletin every week. And this has been going on. And the whole congregation is talking about, where's our flowers? And then suddenly one day they came to church on a Sunday morning and the flowers were back. And everybody's, what? 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 And, and when the preacher got up to preach, he said, I have a confession to make. I took the flowers. And you could hear the gasp. What? We have been, uh, we've lost sleep over this for the last two months. And, and he said, and here's why I did it. We called people, we emailed people, we put it in the bulletin, we made announcements. Um, where's the flowers? And I want to know why there are people who are sitting by you in the pews that have been gone just as long and we've not done anything. Ouch. Could that be us? More concerned about an absent flower than an absent Christian? We need to get our priorities right. And if we don't have the faith in God and his word, we're never going to fulfill the mission. If we believe in the word of God, that the lost will be damned, that there is really a hell, and those outside of Christ, that will be their eternal destiny. If you really believe that, how can you not be evangelistic? If you don't believe it, if you think, oh, there's some side door, God will have mercy, he'll just overlook it, you know, after all, he's a good God. If you think that people can die outside of Christ and still be okay, there won't be any motive to preach the gospel. We have to believe if we're going to fulfill the mission of Jesus. I think there's a powerful statement made in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. The Apostle Paul said, and it's kind of a motto or a proverb that was well known at that time, we believe, therefore we speak. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Since we believe what God has said, how can we not speak it? If the lost are really lost, and I know that to be the case, how can I not tell people? Jeremiah went through his own personal dilemma in Jeremiah chapter 20 when he was held up to derision every day and he was sick of it. He said, all I get from preaching the gospel, preaching the truth back then, was... Um, Heartache. People were criticizing, ridiculing me, holding me in derision. I quit. I'm done. I'm not preaching anymore. But the text goes on to say that there was a burning in his bones and it welled up inside of him and he had to speak. He couldn't stay silent. That's what happens when we have faith, when we really believe. We can't stay silent. Um... We need to stop with the excuses. Do you think we ever have excuses? I haven't been through any kind of evangelism training courses, and so I'm not really qualified to do that. Or maybe we say, um, I don't know the Bible quite like I should. There are people up better. And they may ask me a question that I don't know how to, to answer. Listen, the excuses need to stop. And you know why? 
evangelism, we treat it as if it's some talent that certain people have and certain people don't have. Like, uh, you know, I, oh, Austin, he's really good at that. But me, I, I'm not really good at that. Um, and so I'll let Austin do the evangelizing. Listen, evangelism isn't a talent. It's a command. You see it in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. You see it in Mark 16, 15, and 16. You see it in Luke 24, 46, and 47. And you see it in John 20 and verse 21. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he gave us marching orders, and it said to be evangelistic. Do you have faith enough in God to do that? Can I ask you a question? Don't ask, answer out loud, but let me just ask you, who's the last person you talked to about Jesus? Who's the last person you invited to church? How long has it been? That needs to be our life. It needs to be our mission to be evangelistic. And if we believe what Jesus said will happen to the lost, we'll, we'll evangelize. We'll talk to people about Jesus. Let me give you the third point. And the third point is this. We need faith to overcome the trials of this life. I mentioned that a little bit when we began the lesson, but let me, let me tell you a little bit more. 2020 was a hard year. Isn't it ironic that it happened in 2020, COVID and all that? You know, every church in the Brotherhood had 2020 vision, you know, as a motto or a theme for that year. And none of us saw what was coming, you know. It's kind of irony uh, with that. But 2020 vision. Well, 2020 was hard on probably everybody, but I feel it was especially hard for us. Um, it started out with our oldest daughter having a miscarriage. Um, that would have been our first grandchild, her first child. And then uh, just a few, well, do you remember when the tornado went through um, Chattanooga back 2020? Uh, just destroyed a lot of play. Well, that was my daughter's house and her husband. That was right in the path of that tornado. They heard it. They got up and ran to a center hallway closet. And before they could even close the door, it hit. And we got a call in the middle of the night. And it was from our daughter. And she said, um, we're safe, but we don't think we can get out of the house. And um, that's a, quite of a disturbing call and, and the storms are so bad that you can't just get in your car and drive down there to where they are and um so that happened and then shortly after that and i think part of it may have there there were a lot of issues but then she had another miscarriage and had to have emergency surgery to save her own life fast forward to about august of 2020 i went to the doctor i had this nagging pain in my side. It wasn't severe. It was just annoying. And, and I was tired of it. And I said, I got to figure out, I thought maybe I had a gall gallstone or a kidney stone or something. And I went to the doctor and they ran scans and so forth. And uh, the day that um, I, I had had some of those scans run, I was in my bedroom and I got a call from the doctor. It's never good when the doctor calls you back. Um, and he said, hey, Steve, listen, I hate to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer and you've got to start treatment immediately. And I don't remember everything that was said. I, I do know that as we found out, I had um, cancer in my lungs. I, they were, my lungs were filled with tumors. I had cancer in my ribs, in my spine, in um, my lymphatic system, in my adrenal glands, in my brain, and in uh, various bones and so forth. Um, it, it, it was all through me. Stage four, I asked the doctor on our first visit to an oncologist, what's the prognosis? And he said, well, you have three months to live. Uh, he said, if it's not in your if it's in your brain, you have three months to live. And it was in my brain. We ended up 
going to MD Anderson. Um, I think there's a lot of providence, and I could tell you and talk to you for hours about some of the providential things that we went through during that period of time. But um, when MD Anderson, we were told, was not taking patients, new patients, we were able to get to MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. The kind of cancer that I had, chemotherapy, was a 3% success rate. You could survive, 3% of the people survived it. Um, so basically, hardly anybody survives it. But they had come out with something called immunotherapy. It's still relatively new, but it is effective in certain kinds of cancer for right now, and it'll be more as time goes on. But it happened to be pretty successful. Something like 57% uh, can survive with immunotherapy. And I began immu immunotherapy and, and did that for two years. And my last scans, uh, maybe four months ago, um, the doctor said, we see no sign of disease in you at this time. And uh, so I go back every six months uh, to have those kind of scans follow up. That is a time when your whole life is turned on its head. I remember the first thing I said to my wife after I told her what the doctor said. She knew something was going on, and she came and stood in the doorway, and I told her that the doctor told me that I had stage four cancer. And we hugged each other, and I remember the first thing saying, help me do this well. I wanted to exhibit faith in um, the process of dying as I saw it. Do you have faith? Uh, is it just a, a doctrinal tenant? Let me tell you, it's, it's so much more pragmatic, so much more helpful to you than just a biblical platform. It gets you through the trials of life. I don't know of anybody that wants to suffer, and I know that there are many people here that have had all kinds of suffering in your life, and you would never choose it. But you know what? Through the eye of faith, you can use that as an opportunity to bring glory to God. And that's what I wanted to do with my illness. I wanted to act and receive and have the attitude and the faith that people would say, how in light of what has happened to him, how does he have such a positive outlook on life? I didn't have to fake it because I had a hope of heaven. I'm a child of God and I've been faithful to him and he'll be faithful to me. Sometimes people ask the question, but why me? I don't think that's a bad question. I just think we ask it at the wrong time. Why me? Why did all this happen to me? You see, we ask that question whenever bad things happen to us, when the circumstances go south and we are really desperate, we lift our eyes to God and say, why me? The question is not bad, the timing's bad. We need to be asking that question when good things happen to you. Why me? When you have everything go your way, when life is a bed of roses for you and blessing after blessing are dropped in your path, that's when you need to be asking God, why me? What did you do to deserve that? Listen, we can use suffering if we have faith as a way to bring glory to God. I want to serve God in good health and in prosperity. That's how I want to do it, and I'm sure you do too. But I have to admit, and I've preached this all my life, and I can't preach it and then suddenly change my mind about it. What I preach is right. I came to the realization that I could be more effective serving God with trial than with prosperity and good health. When I faced what I faced the last three years, I believe that I was more effective as a preacher. I believe I preached with more urgency. I was emboldened to reach out to people who obeyed the gospel, by the way, that I was timid 
around before. But I had the ability to say, listen, you know, I don't know how long I have, and I really need to say something to you. And, and it worked. You see, through tragedy, if we have faith, we can see ourselves as a tool of God. A man by the name of Tozer used, wrote a book one time, and, and he said, if, if the nail were to describe a hammer... How would he describe the hammer? And, and he goes on to say he would describe it as a relentless opponent that beats his head into submission. But if the nail could see that that hammer was held by a great carpenter, an architect who was building something beautiful, then he could take the blows understanding their purpose. Faith allows you to see suffering through those eyes. It allows you to see that maybe God has chosen you through suffering to bring glory to his name. He's entrusted you with suffering. And when you view it with that faith, you can actually embrace unpleasant circumstances and use them to God's glory. Faith, we're told, is the victory that overcomes the world, 1 John 5 and verse 4. Man, we need faith. We need people who have a faith and a belief like our father Abraham who trust in him absolutely, trust in God absolutely. We need that faith to be pleasing to God. We need that faith to fulfill our mission. And listen, we need that faith to get through life that, well, if you haven't experienced it yet, hang around because your suffering will come. And what will you do without faith? I, my appeal to you tonight is to put your faith in God. Really believe in him. And what I mean by that is not say, yep, there's a God. I absolutely believe there's a God. No, I'm talking about trusting in God. Whatever he asks you to do, do it. You may not even know what he asks of you yet, but to have the resolve, the faith, the belief that no matter what he says, I'm going to do it. I, I challenge you to that. And if you will commit to that, not only will you be found pleasing to God, but he'll reward you with everlasting life. There are a lot of people that need to quit playing church. You know, when I was a kid, did you, ever, did you ever play church at home? We used to, my sister was older than me. We would play church. We would get her baby dolls. I hate to admit this. I'm going to have to give up my man card to somebody after church here. But we, we, we would play, she'd put all of her baby dolls on the steps. And, and I would preach a little, and we'd sing, and sometimes we'd take them to the bathtub, you know, and, and even baptize the babies. It's okay for kids to play church. It's not okay for adults to play church. There are a lot of people that don't have the kind of faith that they should have. Oh, they go to church. They believe in the existence of God. But that faith is not a faith that is built on trust. The willingness, as Abraham did, to follow him no matter what he asked. I am with you and I trust you with my life. We need to have that kind of faith. Turn your life over to him and trust him and do what he asks you to do. And you'll never have regrets. If you're here tonight and you're not yet a child of God, I encourage you to obey the gospel. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Trust him. 
Jesus said that. Don't argue with them. Don't have to figure things. Just do what he said. If you need to do that tonight, we can assist you in that. And if you're a child of God already but unfaithful, and, and maybe you haven't been living up to the kind of faith that your father Abraham had, commit yourself to do better. And if you need the prayers of your brethren while we're assembled here today, uh, you can come forward as well, and we'll pray with you that you be stronger and more faithful. If you need to respond, we invite you to come as we stand together and sing. Light of his word. This year's lectureship program and selected the theme in times like these and also selected the topics and assigned them to these preachers but knowing these men that have spoken on this program I knew all I had to do was just give them the topic uh, they could develop it uh, because they're capable they're able well studied men and each one has been a blessing to hear uh, the three messages presented by Brother Merle on Sunday morning and uh, the one we heard by Brother Rhymes on Monday night, the one we heard last night by Brother Goodwin, and tonight's message, well, I don't always say this about a sermon, but it was just a beautiful message, and I appreciated it, and uh, it's helped me. I know where our trust must be, I know where I want mine to be, and it's in the God of heaven, right? Uh, he is still on the throne, our faith is still in him, 
He will see us through no matter what comes our way. I'm convinced of that more and more. And what a wonderful three-point message we've heard tonight on the subject at hand. And we are so thankful that uh, uh, Brother Steve is doing as well as he is regarding his health. Well, we thank God for that because I know that uh, was a struggle uh, for him and for Sister Kim, uh, not just receiving that news, but as they've gone through uh, many trips to MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, and he's still, of course, keeping a check on his health, but we will continue to pray that all will go well. And I'm so glad that uh, both of them could be here tonight and that he could preach this sermon. When I thought about the theme in times like these, I'm reminded of an old-time hymn that's not in our hymn books, but that is the title of the hymn, In Times Like These. And one a particular stanza, you remember Brother Lucian, it says, In times like these we need a Savior. In times like these we need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. His name is Jesus, right? And we want to be gripping hold of that solid rock tonight by faith in Him. What a wonderful way to close out this lectureship series. Now we uh, will do this again next year about this time, the Lord willing. Be a different theme, different topics, and uh, some different speakers. Uh, but this is something uh, that has become an annual event we're thankful for it. Thank you, Austin, for starting this lectureship several years ago. Brother Austin means a lot to us here. He's working now, as most of you know, full time with House to House, Heart to Heart. Uh, but he started us off Sunday in a word of prayer. Would you close us tonight also, Brother Austin, in a word of prayer after Kaysen leads us in the closing song? And by the way, you might want to know this. Tomorrow, my boy here will be a quarter of a century He's turning 25 tomorrow. Hard for his mother and me to believe that, but anyway, that's it. Uh, so come lead us in our closing song, Kaysen, and then we look forward to being here this coming Sunday, our regular uh, time schedule, 9.30, 10.30, and 5. And let me mention this, and I'll be finished. But this past month, I presented four articles in the bulletin each Sunday. Did you know if you read those articles? I hope you did. They were all on marriage. The title of the article, Am I Fit to Be Tied? I originally wrote those articles back in 1996, right before Salisha and I got married. And so uh, I reproduced them. But by request, those will be my four sermons on Sunday mornings in the month of February, okay? I usually will preach a sermon, then write the article later. It's reversed this time, all right? But I trust that they will be a blessing to all those who are contemplating marriage, those who are married, and for those of you that uh, have been married and uh, widowed perhaps, you can just sit back and say, uh-huh, he's right about that. Okay. <laughs> Casey. Number 462. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink the press
We come each night to put worldly things aside and focus on the spiritual things and the things that really matter in this world. Lord, we know that we're living in perilous times, as the Bible says, and that we are living in times that we truly need the Bible and that we need to believe and that we need our brethren and that we need to be bold and we need to be balanced in our lives. And Lord, we just pray that we take these lessons that we've heard this week and apply them to our lives, that we can be better servants of yours, that we will be better Christians and bring others to you because of the way that we live. Lord, we're thankful for our speakers that were able to come to us this week. Pray for Brother Merle and Brother Rhymes and Brother Cliff as they brought great lessons and thankful for them coming here and returning home safely. Lord, we're so thankful for Brother Higginbotham and what he means to the kingdom and thankful for the great work that he's involved in at Carnes and the Southeast Institute in Knoxville as he helps the school there and just continue to be with him as he labors there and that uh, you continue to uh, give him good health, that he will continue to use that health to serve you. And Lord, pray that we will have a faith and that will help us through those trials of life and have a faith that is pleasing to you and have a faith that produces good fruit and be able to reach out to others. And we're just so thankful for the lesson we heard tonight and be with Brother Higginbotham and his lovely wife as they travel home tonight and be with them and keep them safe. Be with us and help us to go out and Spread the goodness, good news of Christ. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.